My name is Maddie Graves. Uh, my name is Ryan Stevens. My name is uh, Matt Lewis. My name is Katie Joseph. A huge school, graduated with 700 kids. About five or 600 students. Middle school, elementary school. Never had any introduction really beyond you know, biology, maybe some ecology, but nothing that related to human effects on the environment. There were a couple classes available, but people really took them for the AP credit. Yeah, I don't think I could have told you what exactly in an, like an organically grown. Never learned anything about the social aspect. I come from a town called Peachtree City. It uh, is the suburbs of Atlanta, just south of Atlanta. It's a golf cart community. So that means uh, there's a lot of golf courses there. There's a lot of trails running through the town. And um, it, it started off as a, a retirement uh, city, but over the years I've been seeing lots of developments. It's, you really didn't have any environmental classes. I never really asked uh, where it came from or like maybe why they were all taste the same and like, I don't know, or even asking about the health of it. We visited Superior Central Schools in Chatham, Michigan to find out more about how this local school is exposing its students to the world of ecology and environmental education. We sat down with Tim Bliss, a teacher who pioneered the development of their environmentally centered curriculum. A large part of my environmental science philosophy is you, you protect what you love. And if you can teach these kids about the world around them, the natural world around them, they're far more likely to treat it the way it needs to be treated and then pass that on to their friends, their family, their children. And in fact, next hour, we're jumping on snowshoes and heading out that door to work in the school forest. Um, they've all been out working on the trails at one point. They've all gone out and t tested water quality and soil uh, macronutrients. We use wind power, solar power as more of an educational tool. Uh, we want it, we want to be able to see the effect. You know, the wind power is powering our hydroponic system, so you can directly see the effect of it. The solar power that we get produces more power than our wind turbines, and mm -hmm. that's simply because the size of our wind turbines aren't too big. Uh, but there again, it's only slowing our meter. At the same time, I can show the students that, yeah, we're only slowing the meter of the school, but this amount of power would be enough for your entire family, most likely. And you could feasibly be off the grid with solar energy. We wanted to find out what it takes to get this type of program off the ground, and what other schools can do to develop a hands-on environmental program of their own. I've spent so much of my life outdoors, it's what I wanted, that's where I want to be if I'm not working, I want to be outside. Uh, when the opportunity came that we needed to expand our science curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, I, my suggestion was, well, let's offer an, an environmental science class, because we had already obtained our Michigan Green School status, We've, we, already start, we already built our wind turbines, but we didn't have an environmental science class yet. So we were already leaning in that direction. So when I made that suggestion and we needed another science class, there we went. Uh, the agriculture and forestry class actually started because we built the hoop house. I'm on a subcommittee of school board members and parents that got together and said, you know, let's start what we call the natural resource initiative. I think we ended up calling it growing our future. And we we're there's four steps to it. The first step was putting up the hoop house, finding the money, putting up the hoop house, growing food out of it. The second step was utilizing the school forest more. Um, the fourth, third step is, what was the third step? Maybe it's the trail system. And then the fourth step is actually, we lease out some farmland to a local farmer and we want to get him involved in our educational process also. Oh yeah. Um, once we started with a hoop house, we saw a need for another class that worked out there a fair amount of time, mm -hmm. plus used the school forest, because we knew that was part of our natural resource initiative also. So we started the agriculture and forestry class. So none of this 
happened all at once. And it, it really wasn't a big master plan on how we got here. It just slowly evolved as the needs progressed. Uh, we do track how much money we saved. Last year uh, in spinach and lettuce alone, we saved approximately $1,200 uh, in just, just greens. This year we kind of expanded to tomatoes and beans and peppers. And we haven't done the cost analysis on that. But there is a, a slight savings. Uh, the big factor is the quality of the food, quality of the nutrition, uh, the experience, teaching these kids that they have the ability to grow their own food. Uh, many of them have parents at garden, but the majority of them don't. And we've had several students that have started gardens of their own at home where they never had a garden before. Uh, also, you gotta remember most of this lettuce and spinach that we normally eat gets trucked in from California. You've got all this consumption of diesel energy when we can grow it in our backyard, which we literally are now, walk out there, harvest it. We haven't used any diesel. Uh, it's higher quality. We know what's in it. There's no pesticides, there's no herbicides. Uh, we go completely organic, mostly so we can tell the parents there's nothing to fear. Now, even though some pesticides and herbicides are relatively safe, we always want to have that ace in the hole where we can say, you don't have to worry about any of that because we never use it. Grants, you know, we I told you about the grant for the turbines. The solar panels are a grant. You know, the state funding is so slim now, and so they barely give you enough to do the bare minimum. Well, you want to attract students. Plus, you know, not only do you want to attract students, you want quality programs for the, the students that live right here anyways. Um, and I don't want to get bored out of my mind. I mean, if I have to do the bare minimum, you know, teach this because the state says so, I don't really want to work in that kind of place. Right. Uh, so we're always looking for grants. The community really came through with a lot of donations. A lot of private individuals and businesses gave us the money to get the hoop house started. <coughs> and then we were able to receive grants from Plum Creek, um, Sioux Tribe of Chippewa Indians, um, Alger County um, Youth Cooperative. I think we ended up getting grants that were $10,500 from those sources. You have to find one or two people on staff that are willing to be outside and doing this kind of work. Uh, that's first and foremost. Uh, second is you need a core of adults that are willing to help. Uh, our natural resource subcommittee, if you want to call it that, of board members and parents, uh, and some of them are just community members that want to help out, have been wonderful. You know, uh, we've got one lady that comes in here, her son graduated two years ago, but she comes to all of our meetings because she feels this is a really good thing. Uh, if you've got their support, they've got connections that you, know, you don't, that are possibly could be just money connections, which you do need, but a lot of times it could be equipment, it could be an idea even. So, I guess you, I guess you'd call it grassroots. You know, you're, you got to start small. There isn't, there isn't enough money out there to say we're going to create this job and give you a little extra for doing it. You know, right now in public schools that doesn't exist. So there's got to be a passion. There's got to be somebody um, that really wants to pursue it. And once you get started, and if the kids really like it, you know. In, in general, they, they want to take a class that's different from all the other ones. And these are all elective classes. It's nothing that you have to. So there's, there's some kids that they just don't want to be outside. So, you know, I don't want that class. And that's fine. They don't have to take it. Uh, but I've had several kids that are upset that they can't take it again for another year. And that's one of our options that we're looking at next year for uh, the agriculture class is creating a year two. It's really going to create a generation of people who are going to make a difference. And it all starts with planting that seed. And like the kids of Superior Central, I think they're bringing a lot of really good things into, into 
to the world in general, university and beyond that. I mean, if it sparks passion in them and it's something they care about earlier on, then, I mean, it'll help them decide which way to take that into the future. For me, it took, I mean, I didn't go straight to college out of high school because I had no idea. And if I had had earlier exposure to this side of science, I might have um, been able to take that direction earlier. Understanding that um, everything I do has an impact. And having the general population understand human effects on the environment would just benefit everybody. I didn't know that there was a method of growing food that didn't involve using pesticides, using fertilizers that come from fossil fuels. I didn't know any of that stuff. Maybe in Peachtree City, people aren't necessarily seeking this type of education for their students. But if a small school garden gets started by the right group of people with support from the community, the project could really take off on its own. The key is to start small. Just getting the cogs turning for the next generation could result in a superior central of Peachtree City. Как будто дома он ему.